Bible this morning to the book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 1, we're going to read one verse together. My message is entitled, Facing Down Your Fears. Facing Down Your Fears. 2 Timothy chapter 1, let's all stand up please for the reading of God's Word. Facing Down Your Fears. 2 Peter, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 7. Let's read it together. You all set? All right, let's begin. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Our Father, God in heaven, we praise you this morning. We lift you up, O God. And Father, we're so thankful that you have not given us a spirit of fear. And Lord, I pray that as I proclaim this message today, that the hand of the living God would be upon me. Strengthen me mightily by thy grace and spirit with might in the inner man, the outer man. And Father, I pray that you anoint the word that it would minister to thy people, Father, those that are here, those who watch by YouTube TV, Lord God, and they'd grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We ask in his blessed name, with all thanksgiving, amen, and you may be seated. Now, beloved, I'm sure that every one of us, every one of us has come home after a hard day's work, and all we want to be able to do is relax and unwind, amen? So we come home, we have a little bit of dinner, then we might chat with the family, then we go and we take a shower, perhaps we find some comfortable clothes to put on, and then we decide what we're going to do is sit back and get some much-needed rest, amen? Been a hard day, time to put your feet up. So, beloved, we go into the living room and we sit down and perhaps we take a little snack with us, some popcorn or whatever, something to drink. Then we take the remote control and we click it on. We click the TV on. We want to see perhaps the news or sports or perhaps our favorite TV show. But when the TV comes on, we find that we're filled with annoying commercials. And all these commercials today seem to be about new medications, don't they? That's all you see, beloved. And you can't even pronounce half of them, beloved, to treat this or that sickness or this or that disease or this or that condition that you may have to help you heal or help you feel better. And sure, some may help, beloved, but when I listen to these commercials, when I listen to the side effects of these meds, beloved, they literally scare the fire out of me. How about you? Now, this can, you know, you can take this medication, but this was going to happen, this was going to happen. You said, good night. <laughs> I'm better off with a disease. <laughs> What am I saying to you? I'm saying, beloved, this is exactly what the big pharmaceutical companies, the pharmaceutical industry, the pharmaceutical uh, uh, advertisers are trying to do. They want to scare the fire out of you so they can sell your product. Someone comes on and says something like this. Have you been having chest pains lately? Do, you, do they seem to radiate down your arm? Are you short of breath? Then this can, could be signs of a dangerous, oncoming heart attack and then what you need to do is talk to your doctor about this new medication that we call HeartFine. You want to be able to take HeartFine. Why? Because HeartFine will stop your chest pains. HeartFine will make you able to breathe much easier. HeartFine will take away those pains that are going down your arms, okay? But if you have any side effects from taking hot fine like nausea or blurred vision or racing heart or you start growing fangs or hair all over your body, then you want to make sure you see your doctor and talk to your doctor about it and stop taking hot fine immediately. Well, after almost choking on everything you just heard, you say, this is it. You take the remote click, you change it to another channel. And you change it to another channel only to see someone else coming on with more scary things. He says, hello, have you been having dry mouth lately? or frequent urination at night, do you have sores that heal slowly, uh, then you need to speak to your doctor about them because he may talk to you about adult onset type 2 diabetes. And by the way, those are signs. Amen, doc? You see, beloved, he, they say make sure you ask your doctor about taking diatril. I've had to make up these names, okay? So there's no real, don't go saying to your doctor, I'd like to get some diatril, okay? Make sure you take some diatril to help you. Diatril will help you get rid of that dry mouth. Diatril will help you sleep through the night so you're not going to the bathroom all the time. And diatril will quickly heal all those open sores. However, after taking diatril and you start experiencing twitching eyes and you start experiencing itching ears, well, itchy palms means money, right? Itching ears, I don't know what that means. 
and you start being able to stutter, 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 stutter what, what, what you want to do is you want to see your doctor and stop taking the, 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 the diatril immediately. So if you're having those symptoms, don't take diatril. Go see your doctor and find out what it is that's going on in your life. You sick? That's it. I'm sick of this. You take the remote control, click it, go to another station, only to find someone else comes on. He says, hey there. Have you felt tired and lifeless lately? <laughs> Hasn't everyone? <laughs> right. Have you felt tired and lifeless lately? Has your get up and go got up and gone? Do you seem to be weak in the knees? Yes. All above. Then you need to speak to your doctor because you may have serious signs of lumbago rotabago. That's a new disease that's come out. We just discovered it. And so what you need to take is our new medication called Pet Me Up Some. So if you take Pet Me Up Some, it will restore your energy. Pet Me Up Some will help you recover your strength. And Pet Me Up Some will make you feel young again. But after taking Pet Me Up Some, you start experiencing loose teeth or brittle finger and toenails and your hair starts falling out, immediately stop taking Pet Me Up Some and see your doctor. Now, beloved, you take the remote control, click, and you just shut off the TV. And by now, you're terrified. By now, your heart's racing. By now, you're thinking you've got all of the symptoms of the disease. And by now, you're wondering, am I as healthy as I thought I was? Good night. I've been exercising. I've been eating right. I've been taking my vitamins. Am I as healthy <coughs> Excuse me. as I thought I was? You see, beloved, the worst part of it is, you look down at your snacks and they're all gone and you don't even remember eating them. <laughs> you ever have that happen? I remember one time I came home and I had, I had to deal with a judge. And him and I went nose to nose. I says, he's going to hold me in contempt of court. I'm going to be in the can, right? I came home, I was mad as a hornet. And Ellie made me three sandwiches. So I saw the plate land there and I says, Ellie, where's my sandwiches? She says, Joel, you ate them. <laughs> I didn't even remember eating those three sandwiches. Uh, these size 28s are getting a little tight. You see, beloved, the fact is most of the symptoms and side effects of these, these new meds and drugs, they almost seem to be worse than the disease, don't they? And unfortunately, sometimes we need these, these uh, new drugs. Diatril, pick me up some. Hard fine. <laughs> because are you going to be okay, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but you see, beloved, you're finally glad. You know what? I'm glad I went to my doctor. He gave me some meds, and I don't have any side effects from it. Thank you very much. Amen. Now, Pastor Joel, what are you getting at? What is it that all of these pharmaceutical and companies want you to know? Oh, no, beloved. What is it? that all these advertisers, all these merchants, what is it that all these vendors and industries know? They know this, beloved. Listen to me now. They know that fear is catchy. They know that fear is infectious. Fear is contagious. And that fear sells like very few other venues or items in this world. Amen? Oh, hear me now, beloved. Why is it that you buy health insurance? I'll tell you why. For fear. Why is it you're buying life insurance? You buy it for fear. Why is it you buy car insurance? You're buying it because of fear. How about home insurance? Well, you know, if your house burns down, all that furniture in there, my house burns down, my furniture, I get a check for $11.06. <laughs> and I probably have to pay the insurance company. But you see, beloved, they know that fear sells. I'm saying fear is a powerful motivator. Fear is a powerful persuader. Fear is a powerful instigator and salesman to get you to buy the products that these vendors are trying to sell. They know that fear gets you to do exactly what they want to do. Why? So they can make a ton of money off you, regardless if it helps you or if it doesn't help you. I hope it does help you. But the bottom line for corporations is the buck, isn't it? That's the bottom line of all businesses, unfortunately. You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? So they appeal to your basic survival instincts, your primal instincts. God has given us three great instincts. Our spiritual, our survival, our, our sexual, and Satan has perverted all of them. And that's what God gave to mankind when he created them in his image and likeness. And beloved, they appeal to your uncontrollable imaginations and emotions. You know when your mind starts running wild? I just know it. I must have that. I've got this symptom. I know I've got that. I've been on the internet looking at all this anecdotal evidence. Don't do that. 
Remember, that's anecdotal evidence, beloved. And so they appeal to the greatest stretch and difficulty and dangers in life that both you and they know we could all indeed someday suddenly and unexpectedly face and encounter and meet with. Therefore, beloved, they try to make you feel so afraid, so fearful, so worried and anxious that unless and until you buy their product or you get their service to prevent and or cure that potential disease and trouble that you may have, beloved, you may needlessly and unnecessarily suffer experience or the experience of the consequential disastrous results if you don't take what they're selling and speaking about. So you start thinking, your mind starts racing. See, beloved, that's what fear does. And we need to understand that. So that's why Paul said to young Pastor Timothy, God has not given you the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Come on and say amen. I'm saying these peddlers know that it is indeed true that in the human experience and in the human life, that we can all identify with these potential and painful diseases and difficulties and dangers whereof we speak and whereof they're trying to sell. Beloved, none of us, none of us in this room, none of us on the top side of this earth is exempt or immune from having to use some kind of medical product throughout the course of our life. Why? Because we live in a cursed and follow body, fallen body and a sin-filled world. Amen? And our bodies are going to degenerate. Our bodies are going to die. And the curse won't be reversed, I told you, till the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. Amen? So what am I saying to you? I'm saying sometimes purchasing some of these medications is indeed needful, beloved, in life because unexpected accidents and injuries and disease does indeed happen to us. So therefore, beloved, for knowing these things could happen, we want to be prepared. Now listen to me, please. We don't want to be scared into preparation. We want to be prepared as God tells us to do. That's called being prudent in the Bible. That's called being sensible. That's called having a sense of self-preservation. In Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 3, Solomon said this, A prudent man foresees the evil. And consequently, when he foresees it, he prepares for it and he avoids it. Would you say amen out there? In other words, if I know my house may burn down because the forest is right there and there's a forest fire coming, I'm going to get my chainsaw around and start cutting down all the brush, all the trees around it. How about you? That way there I can keep the fire as far away from my house as I possibly can. So, beloved, now listen to me. Old Slewfoot. Satan himself has gotten them to hereby occupy and pry on our fears. His sinister proposal, his sinister plot and plan in our life is to use fear as his diabolical weapon and leverage over us. Why? Why does he want to do that? To so negatively and fearfully impact and influence our lives that will turn from looking in faith and trust to God's sovereign control over us to God's providential care and concern over us, beloved, in our lives, to looking to and trusting in people and trusting in things and trusting in everything else in this fallen evil world system, beloved, in times of trouble, instead of us looking to our God. Would you say amen? Now listen to me. God may lead you to take that, that medication, this medication, go to that doctor, whatever, but the first person you want to see is the great physician, Jehovah Rofika. Would you say amen out there? That's the first person you want to see because he's in sovereign control over your life. Of course, beloved, our God and his divine providence, our God in his benevolent mercy and grace has allowed men to discover medicines and material things to help us alleviate the pain and suffering caused by sin. God has kept doctors on this earth to treat our infirmities, to keep us along, uh, alive long enough that we can hear the gospel. Would you say amen out there? So being called as a doctor, I've told my doctor this. That's a high and holy calling. And so we ought to thank God for them. But beloved, listen to me. These ought to be our secondary, not our primary things that we're to look for when pain and problems are right in our life. God and God alone and no one and nothing else is in sovereign control of our life. And through faith, we ought to trust and rest in his person, in his power, 
in his providence, in his promises, in his precepts, beloved, knowing that he will either allow them or send these things to come in our life. Why? Because he's constantly and continuously in the process of sanctifying us and getting us ready for heaven. And it takes a lot of things to get us prepared for heaven. And so all of us are going to go through the furnace of affliction at one time or another in our life. None of us is exempt. We're all going to do it. Amen? So therefore, beloved, there's no need for us to ever have to live in fear or worry. There's no need that we ever have to live with anxiety or dis-ease or consternation, beloved. But we can live in peace and with God. And we can live with joy, the joy of God. And we can live with a hope and faith and confidence in God and trust in God. You know, the Bible says that we're to walk by faith and not by sight. We're to walk by faith and not by uh, uh, looking into this world and say, they're my God and I'm going to trust them before I trust my God. Beloved, we're to walk by faith and not by fear. We're to walk by faith in Almighty God and always keep Him in the forefront of our mind. Amen? What I'm saying is using fear like this is a subtle and a sinister ploy. It's a maneuver by the devil because he is the very God of this evil world system and loves to use fear to run and control and ultimately ruin our lives. This is a weapon in his diabolical arsenal that he likes to use. He wants to use fear to get control of your mind and your thinking process. He wants to use fear, beloved, to manipulate your emotions and so negatively influence our intellect into running our life. My dad used to say, son, don't ever let uh, emotions run your life without the benefit of intellect first. And I've had to learn that over the years. When I, instead of getting emotionally charged up, whew, calm down, Joel, back it down a couple of notches. Think this through. You see, beloved, he wants to use fear to immediately move us to react and look to everyone and everything else in this evil world system except God when disease or dangers or difficulties come into our life. He wants us to first look to the government and state for help, doesn't he? That's what, that's what Satan's trying to do right now, make government God. He wants us first to look to the lawyers or politicians or first look to scientists or doctors or medicines before we ever look for God. You see, Satan wants us to first look to them as our Savior to solve all of our problems and not our God. God may use every one of them, but first you must go to God. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, Satan very subtly and unconsciously tries to influence us into being willing to ultimately give up our personal security, give up our safety, our rights, our freedoms as Bible-believing Christians. I've told you for years in Sabbath school that a United States Constitution in America will be amended. We will lose our First Amendment right, Second Amendment right, according to Revelation chapter 13, and we are doing that right now before your very eyes. You're seeing, beloved, that Americans are giving up their freedoms for safety. I'll tell you what, I'd rather die free than be safe and in bondage. How about you? I know what it's like to fight the, fight the communists. I fought in the second communist war, not Korea, Vietnam. And I don't want to be under a fascist government or a communist government or a socialist government. I don't want that, and I don't think you do either. Now, beloved, why will people do this? Because people will do anything for economic security. The government said, we'll make you healthy and wealthy. You'll prosper if you do what we're telling you to do. See, that's how socialism creeps in, by the way. Government becomes God and gives you everything. You have to go to government. We want small government, government and self-government. Amen? Not a big, huge government like we have right now. So what am I saying to you? I'm saying this is Satan's diabolical scheme, beloved, to ensure that his Antichrist is able to get and exert his power, his control over this new world order that's coming in the last days with little or no resistance from the people on the top side of this earth. You see, he's got a plan. You know, as Jesus says, in your patience, possess your soul. Satan knows I can be patient. Cement does not flash freeze. It hardens incrementally. Little by little, as my dad used to say, goes the fiddle. Amen? And so Satan knows that little by little. You're not going to give everything up at once, but if he can give it incrementally for you to do it, that's what's going to happen in your life. You see, Satan will use fear to cause his greatest enemies. Who's that? 
Satan's greatest enemies are God's people. It's God's church on the top side of this earth. We're the only ones that can oppose, expose, and depose of him. And what he wants us to do is learn how to stop thinking and start thinking like him. And that's what he's doing with the people of this world. My dad said to me, believe nothing you hear and only half of what you see. How many parents ever told you that? A lot of you probably have heard your mom and dad say that. If not, get a new mom and dad, okay? You see, Satan will use fear, beloved, to cause his global panic and terror, terror in this world. And Satan will use uh, fear to cause his deviant brainwashing and programming in this world to create a herd mentality. So everybody starts walking in lockstep, thinking the same thing, doing the same thing, wanting the same thing. And we just shoot off the lips saying the same thing. We repeat what we hear over and over and over again without asking God, help me to discern this, help me to look into this, help me to think this through. So Satan knows what he's doing, beloved. He wants us to be like mechanical robots. And Satan wants to use fear to cause his despotic totalitarian totalitarian unity in these last days, ladies and gentlemen. How? To get you to walk like this. To do exactly what it is that he wants you to do. Walk in lockstep, beloved. You know, the Bible says that in the last days there will be a global outcry. What did I say? A what? A global outcry in this world for peace and safety. In other words, all Asia, Africa, the America, all of the continents of the world have been crying out, peace and safety, peace and safety, peace and safety. Are they doing that now? You bet your bippy they're doing that right now. Because what it's doing is setting the stage for the coming Antichrist. Listen to me, beloved. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3 warns, When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction shall befall them like travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. In other words, little do they know that they're calling down their own day of judgment, their own doom on themselves by doing that. They are fulfilling prophecy. Peace, safety, peace, safety. No matter what the cost. No matter what. If God is left out of the picture. Peace, safety. We want peace, safety. And people will give up all their rights because of that, but not me. I'm going down swinging. I don't know about you. You see, beloved, Satan's patient, and he knows what fear can do. We see it all through the Bible, and I don't have time right now to talk to you about that, beloved, only to say this. Satan wants to use fear to help you or move you so you will not face down your own personal fears in life. You hear what I'm saying to you? Because all of us may have them. And Satan's going to use fear so you don't come face to face with them like you're looking in the mirror. And so sadly, beloved, fear so controls people. Perhaps it's you. Maybe fear controls you. That you're afraid of facing down your fears when confronted and expected trial, unexpected trials and troubles and tribulation and come that you may even run from them. So Paul here gives us three profound truths about facing down your fears. Now, you may want to write these down, beloved. Paul gives us three profound truths. I'm going to, I'll repeat them for you. But first thing, I want you to see what God hasn't given, given us. Secondly, I want you to see what God has given us. And thirdly, I want you to see what God himself gives us. First point is what God hasn't given us. Second point is what God has given us. And the third point is what God himself gives us. Now, let's look at point number one, what God hasn't given us. Look at verse uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 and 7a. He says, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance, Timothy, thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. That's important, beloved, when a person gets ordained. That's why you have ordination committees to make sure they're called. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. God has not given us the what? The spirit of fear. Now here the Apostle Paul reminds Timothy that he's been called. He's been ordained to be a pastor. Timothy was the first real pastor of the church at Ephesus. So when you're reading the book of Ephesus, and when you read Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 8, and it talks about the church at Ephesus, you can think of young Pastor Timothy. He was the first uh, pastor there. And then John ultimately from the Isle of Patmos, when he was released, that's where he went. He went to Ephesus. But beloved... Paul's reminding Timothy also of 1 Timothy, uh, uh, 1 Timothy 4.14. 
how that when the presbyters laid their hands on him, God supernaturally bestowed upon him a spiritual gift. And that spiritual gift that God gave him was to pastor and to preach. And Paul is reminding Timothy, beloved, that he is to now fight the good fight of faith in the spiritual battle. You see, beloved, young Pastor Timothy, I know when I got into the ministry, I was, I was more seasoned because I was 30 years old at that time. That was a couple years ago. But he showed fear, signs of fear and timidity and weakness in the ministry when he was confronted by tough people, confronted with tough problems, beloved both inside and outside of the church. Some people get right up in your face and they spit all over you and you have to do everything you can to hold it in so you don't clock them and give them the right hand of fellowship. <laughs> they get right up in your face, right? And half of them don't even know what they're talking about because when you know somebody else's business, you can't betray their confidence and give them the rest of the facts for the decision that you had to make, Amen. And so what am I saying to you, beloved? I'm saying this, that young Pastor Timothy was confronted with all kinds of problems inside the church, outside the church. And when personal attacks came, beloved, and they came at him fast, and they came at him furiously, beloved, he began to cower. He began to cringe and compromise and tremble in fear in the face of all these dangers, in the face of all these difficulties. His natural instinct was to quit and run, just like us. His natural instinct was to back off and back down, just like a lot of people do. His natural instinct, beloved, was to not stand and face up and deal with these things like a lot of people. He wanted to just throw in the towel. And I understand that, but you listen to me. It is satanic influence. It is satanic intimidation that gives us this cowardly attitude and spirit. Now, the word fear here in your text is delia. And it means this, beloved. It means that God did not give you the spirit of fear and faint-heartedness when difficulties come. Satan did. It means that God did not give you the spirit of cowardice and timidity or dread or worry or anxiety when difficulties come. The devil himself gave it to you. And beloved, it means that God did not give you the spirit of weakness and faintness, beloved, when dangers come and when difficulties come. The devil did, beloved. And the same is likewise true for all of us. So we need to remember that because we have a tendency to forget a lot of things. That's why in, in uh, the Ten Commandments, God said about the Fourth Commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy because everybody wants to forget about it. Oh, I remember the other nine, but the fourth one, you know, Jesus becomes our Sabbath. You know, I challenged the pastor on that one day. I said, give me one text that showed me that Jesus became my Sabbath. He's my salvation Sabbath the rest of soul for sure. But my weekly day of rest and worship that he sanctified and blessed, that's still intact. Okay. <laughs> well, we think you can choose any day that you want. You go ahead and do that. I'll follow what God says. Matt, I want to show you how stupid that argument is. I'm a pastor. And beloved, I wear myself out preaching. I, can you imagine if it's left up to us to choose what day we're going to worship? Dave says, I want to worship on Sunday. So I have to preach to Dave on Sunday. And Derek says, I want to do it Tuesday. So I preached to Derek on Tuesday. But Cheryl comes along and says, I can only make it Monday, Pastor Joel. And then so-and-so comes along and says, I can do it Thursday. I can do it Wednesday. I can do it Friday. I can do and God says, you can do it Sabbath day. That's the day of corporate worship. I have chosen the day, not you. I've chosen the day for corporate worship. Would you say amen out there? So, beloved, what are we to do? Paul tells Timothy here, beloved, in verse 6, to stir up and adzo gureo. It means to strong and passionately and zealously wake up and whip up and work up and arouse in us. Notice what he says, the charisma thea. That is the gift of God. We say charisma, it's charisma of God. The theos of God, beloved. For young Pastor Timothy, no doubt the gift that he was to stir up was the gift of pastoring. It was the gift of preaching, beloved, when he got ordained, whereas for us, it's the spiritual gifts and talents that God gives us by the Holy Spirit when we get saved, and every Christian is given at least one gift. Some have many more. Amen? But, beloved, he's also given us other gifts, like the gift of faith, like the gift of power, like the gift of courage, like the gift of boldness to help us face down our fears. 
And the Bible says we need to stir up, we need to rekindle these gifts in us, lest we forget about them. Why? Because fear has a way of creating amnesia in us. Amen? Fear is very powerful. You know, in Romans 8, 15, Paul said to the church at Rome, For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. You had the spirit of bondage before you got saved, and you were fearful of everything. But he says, you've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. So Satan wants us to be in bondage to our fears. Why? Why did you do that, beloved? So we can become ineffective as Christians. And there's nothing worse than an ineffective Christian because he's paralyzed and neutralized by a spirit of fear. Nothing worse. I, I, if I do that, this is what's going to happen. And if I do this, Pastor Joel, you don't know what's going to happen right here. Well, some, sometimes you just have to take a shot in the dark and by faith trust that God's with you. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying a spirit of fear is a literal spirit. It's a spirit sent from the devil, beloved. And that's what he wants to do. He does want to paralyze you in your walk. He wants to neutralize you, beloved. And you have faith in your faithfulness. Why? Because he wants to prevent you from serving the Lord and also dealing with the personal issues that each and every one of us in this room has in our life. Amen? That's why he sends that spirit of fear. The spirit of fear comes from demonic attacks. It comes from demonic activity in your life to give you a constant and continuous inner feeling of dread and dismay and foreboding in your life so you'll not face down your fears, beloved, and live triumphantly for Christ in the shadow of the victory of the cross of Calvary. Would you say amen? That's the last thing he wants you to do. The Bible says in Colossians 2.15, And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Who's the them? It's the devil himself, the demons himself. That's what Calvary did. Calvary said, you're not the boss, I'm the boss. Would you say amen? And so, beloved, when demons and devils try to attack and assail you, beloved, you can be assured that it isn't God that's giving you that spirit of fear. Amen? So the spirit of fear, I'm telling you, is a spirit. It's a real spirit. It's a demon. It's a presence. It's a feeling. It's a thought. It's a power that always seems to plague and overwhelm you. That constantly and continuously fills you with that feeling of dread and foreboding. Pastor, I just know something bad's going to happen. I can feel it. You know, when I was in combat, I can't tell you how many guys would say to me, Sergeant Patello, I can't go out on this patrol. I know I'm going to get killed. I know, I know, I know, I know. And they would make it back. I said, I'm sure you didn't know anything. You made it back. So these feelings are real. And beloved, it's a spirit that always seems to lead you to see the worst and the most negative and pessimistic side of everything. And this spirit of fear was palpable. You can feel it, ladies and gentlemen. And it leaves you with such timidity and such reticence and such cowardice that you always seem to live a defeated and beaten down or beaten up Christian life. I'm saying you never want to face your problems now. You never want to deal with painful issues. You never want to confront the people or problems that you know you have to confront. Beloved, I can't tell you, I can't tell you how many times I've had to confront all kinds of people. Powerful people. You know, people say to me today, I wish I were a prophet. I said, no, you don't. If you ever know anything at least about the Old Testament, God always sent the prophet to tell the king what to do. And then they would run for their life like Elijah did with King Ahab. Amen? God is going to judge you, O King Ahab. He's going, you're the troubler of Israel, not me. And God said, run for your life. <laughs> so you don't want to be a prophet like that. You know, we have these little, oh, I think, you know, this was going to happen. I had a dream. I had a dream. You know, I'm so sick of hearing that. I, I can't tell you, beloved. I don't run my, Bible, my life by my dreams. I run it by my Bible. How about you? And if my dream correlates with my Bible, then I know God gave it to me. That's a whole other subject, and I'll talk to you about that one of these days. You see, beloved, uh, why does this happen? Because... You have a spirit of fear that now controls you and it scares you and it rules over you. 
You have a spirit of fear that now defeats you, beloved. But he says here that God has not given us the spirit of fear. So I need to reconcile that in my heart and believe that this spirit of fear that I'm experiencing, that I'm enduring right now, did not come, did not come, did not come from the hand of God. Would you say amen? It did not come from God. You know, in Proverbs 28, 1, it says this, that the wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. What? You want me to what? There's no way. Fee, fi, fo, fum. I smell the blood of an Englishman. Come on ahead. I'm going to have not done all. The Bible says what? Stand. Stand and fight. Hunker down. You know, our Lord Jesus said this in John 14, 27. He said, let not your heart be troubled. Now listen, he closed by saying, and neither let it be afraid. So that means I have some control over that. Amen. The word let there means to permit it. Don't permit it to be troubled. Don't permit it to be afraid. I always say to my wife, she said, Joel, this is happening. I said, cool your jets. What are you going to do, shoot me? I've already been shot. (laughs) If I die, I go to heaven. It's a win-win situation. Cool your jets. What are they going to do to you? They're going to make you eat pea soup and liver. I love it. I'll tell you a quick story about that. Before I went to Vietnam, I hated pea soup and liver. And we were on an operation. 93 days, we were eating out of World War II sea ration cans. You'd open up a can. In fact, I was showing it to a surgeon a couple weeks ago, and he said, that's the P-38. And I'm going to give him one. I've got an extra one that I brought home. It's a little can opener. And we use it here. Uh, my wife's come to me many times, and the people have said, uh, how can we open up this can of tuna and give the kids this? I said, well, come in my office. So I take my little P-38 and open it right up. I was just carrying on my dog tag around my neck. And I was going somewhere with that. What was that? Oh, so we had, we've been eating sea rations, okay? The 1945 issue, you open up a can of peanut butter, it looked like a hockey puck. You had to take a piece of C4, which is plastic explosive. If you heat it with a match, it'll burn like a torch. Put a blasting cap in, it'll blow this building apart. So we take a piece, put it in a can, knock a couple holes in the can, heat up our water, and we eat it. So for 93 days, we hadn't had any hot chow, eating one sea ration a day. And so we come down from the mountain, and they had a tent set up to bring the, they said, we're going to feed the Marines. So we come down. Guess what was on the menu? Pea soup and liver. (laughs) To this day, I love pea soup and liver. Honestly, that's the truth. I mean, not only that, I probably shouldn't tell you this, but I'm going to. I hadn't taken a shower in 93 days, so I took off all my clothes. I put a towel around me, and one of the uh, uh, scouts had his dog there with him to sniff out the enemy. So I walked by him. I said, hi, boy. He went, and he got here. <laughs> so I went and got my 45, right? I was going to shoot him. Go, no, 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 no. He didn't know. He didn't know. <laughs> he got a hold of me, right? I said, I'm going to bite him. He does that again. <laughs> But beloved, I'm saying to you, the spirit of fear is satanic. It's demonic, and it's despotic, and it is tormenting, beloved, like a cruel tyrant. It wants to rule you. It wants to reign over you. It wants to control your life, beloved. And so you can be sure that the spirit of fear is not of God. The question is, do you personally have a spirit of fear? The question is, beloved, Do you succumb to a spirit of fear? Do you want to be delivered from a spirit of fear? You say, Pastor Joel, "Uh uh-huh. I want to be delivered from a spirit of fear. Now listen to me, it's just this simple. Listen to me now. 2 Corinthians 2.14 says this, But thanks be unto God, thanks be unto God, who always causes us to triumph in Christ. Would you say amen? In other words, beloved, this is how you're delivered, through faith in Christ, who's always present with you, who is your divine bodyguard. But you need to be mindful of that and aware of that biblical truth in your life. Now, beloved, we've seen what God hasn't given us. I want us to see the stark contrast of what the Lord gives us. So point number two is what God has given us. I want you to look at 2 Timothy chapter 1. Verse 7b, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now, beloved, to be sure, I don't want to sound heartless right here. All of us 
have momentary fears in our life at one time or another because we're human. Because of our fallen, feeble, finite flesh. And so we do have them, beloved. We know that we're weak. The older I get, the more I am aware, poignantly aware of that fact. That I'm not half the man I used to be. You know, I think it was Paul McCartney that sang, When I'm 64, when I'm 64, when we, can, we still need me, we used to. Well, I long past that. <laughs> and I'm, I'm laughing, right, because they're saying in France right now, they're all rebelling because they're going to move, the, Macron wants to move the retirement age from 62 to 64. I said, you've got to be kidding me, right? Everybody's up in arms over it. Make it to 64. Hang in for a couple more years. That's all I can tell you. But, beloved, we know this. We know that we do not know the outcome of the future, do we? We don't know a lot of things. Only God knows. I don't know the future, but I know who holds the future. Amen? And so this can make us afraid. It can make us worry. It can fill us with anxiety, beloved. And it also can help us see just how totally dependent we are on God's person and on God's power and on God's providence and on God's promises and on God's precepts. How important, vitally important it is. Especially when you're going through a trial, beloved. That's why I memorize so much scripture so I can quote it over and over and over and over again. I remind God. I said, Lord, you said this. You said this. And I remind him about that. You know, Jesus said this. Listen to what he said. He says, without me, ye can do nothing. The word ye is second person plural, ye all. That's why I love the KJV when it uses that word. Ye all. Without me, he says, ye can do nothing. But Paul says in Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. In other words, Joel, you can't do it in your natural flesh. You don't have enough strength. You don't have enough power. You don't have enough muscle. You're over the hill. You're getting older now. But you trust in Jesus and he can give you the power and strength that you need. I can do all things, Paul says. Not some things. He said, what? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So if we truly believe in God's aid and truly believe in God's assistance, beloved, and truly believe it is intervention in our life, we should be able to conquer and overcome and triumph over this malevolent spirit of fear and never, ever shrink or uh, shirk or shrink back from doing our duties and fulfilling our responsibilities or having to confront the people that we need to confront or the problems or being victorious in the spiritual battle. If we truly believe that God has not given us the spirit of fear and that God is always with us, and that he's an ever-present God in time of troubles, Psalm 46 1 says. Then, beloved, then I'll tell you something right now. You'll get rid of that spirit of fear. In Isaiah chapter 54, in verse 17, listen to what he says. Now, let me give you a little background here. Just to, Israel's not gone into Babylonian captivity. And God says to the children of Israel, when you, you're going to go to Babylon. If you fight going to Babylon, you're going to die. I'm going to send you to Babylon for 70 years because of your sins, because of your idolatry, because of everything you're doing. But when you go there, I want you to plant crops. I want you to build houses because I'm going to sustain you. And after 70 years, I'm going to bring you back. Jeremiah talks about that. And we read in the book of Daniel, the 490 years. And I can't go there right now. Wish I could. But what I'm saying is this. He, he said to them, uh, they, they were afraid to leave Jerusalem. They were afraid that the Chaldeans were going to kill them. The Babylonians, the Chaldeans. In Isaiah 54, 17, he says that no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn, for this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Come on and say amen out there. No weapon that's formed against these children. The Chaldeans can try off the, everything they want. You know God called Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, my servant. And he says, my servant's going to do this to you. When he gets through doing it to you, fulfilling my will, that I'm going to do this to him. And I believe Nebuchadnezzar ultimately got saved. How about you, according to the scripture? And we'll see old Neb in heaven. I asked him what that insanity was for seven years, what it was like. <laughs> I was crazy once. <laughs> You see, beloved, he gives us a supernatural spirit of courage. And he gives us confidence, beloved, and boldness and assurance and strength to face 
down our fears, amen, and overcome in the spiritual battle and not succumb to it or be overcome by it. Oh, listen to me. God has not made us to be chicken yellow bellied, chicken livered with jello for spines. God's not made us like that. And God's not made us to be intimidated or losers or victims, beloved. I want you to note these three powerful things God has given us under point number two. Number one, he's given us the spirit of power. Number two, he's given us the spirit of passion. And number three, he's given the soundness of perception. I'm going to take them one by one for you. How's that sound? For a slight fee, of course. First thing I want you to see is the spirit of power. He says, God has not given you the spirit of fear, but notice what he says here, of power. The word power there is the Greek word dunamis. That is mighty and miraculous supernatural power. Mighty and miraculous supernatural force and energy. Mighty miraculous spiritual dynamite, the dynamite of the Holy Spirit who indwells us. And beloved, the Holy Spirit is omnipotent. He's almighty. He's invincible. In 1 John 4, 4, the Bible says this, Greater is he who is in you, that is Christ via the Holy Spirit. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. He's greater than the devil. He's greater than Satan. He's greater than demons. He's greater than principalities and powers. Greater is he who's in you. He's going to be in you today, Monica. In you, Johnny. Greater is he who is in you. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying he's infinitely greater than all of your weaknesses and all of your sicknesses and problems and difficulties that you may face in life, and all the trials and foes that you may come against. Yea, the Bible says this in Romans 8.26. It says, likewise, the Spirit himself helpeth our infirmities. Imagine that, beloved. The Spirit is a person. Yea, the Spirit himself helpeth our infirmities. In other words, he gets personally involved in the infirmities you may have in your life. Meaning he's always present in our lives to constantly and continuously help us overcome our adversaries and our adversities and our afflictions and hardships and whatever else you may face in your life. The Bible says in Romans 8, 37 through 39, beloved, I love this. I quote it all the time. But Paul says this to the church of Rome. He says, nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors. Then he lists them. He goes on and he says this, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall ever be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Would you say hallelujah out there? And amen. Okay. You see, beloved... Jesus supernaturally calms all the great storms in our life. You remember when the disciples were out on the Sea of Galilee and then this storm brewed up. I believe Satan was trying to kill our Savior. But the Bible says that the disciples were terrified. And here's the wind, and here's the wave sloshing against the boat, and there's Jesus in the stern of the boat. And they say, Master, Master, we perish, we perish. And Jesus gets up. And the Bible says he rebuked the waves, he rebuked the wind, he rebuked the storm, beloved, and he said, peace, be still, and know that I am God. Would you say amen? Peace, be still, and know that I am God. And then he turned, the Bible says to his disciples in Matthew 8, 26 and 440. I'm giving you the listing so you can read it. He says, why are you so fearful, O ye of little faith? How is it that you have no faith? Here is the son of the living God sleeping in the back of the boat. You think you're going to drown? How much closer to God <laughs> do you want to be? In other words, beloved, he was saying something like this. Haven't I promised you that I will never leave thee nor forsake thee? Yea, Lord. He says, then believe it. And, and uh, face down your fears. Heaven, I said, yea, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Yea, Lord, then believe it and face down your fears. Heaven, I told you that nothing is impossible with God. Yea, Lord, I remember when you said that. Did you believe it? Then believe it and you'll be able to face down every fear that comes your way. Oh, we have such short memories, don't we? 
That's why you need to memorize scripture. Monomics. Memorize. Memorize. Someday you'll be thrown in a cell. And you won't have a Bible. And you're going to have to have something you can call on. And you want to make sure it's the Word of God. Would you say amen out there? Oh, beloved, listen to me. Knowing that God has given us the spirit of power and courage, it's an ins- uh, essential uh, an empowering characteristic and component for all believers if you ever truly want to be able to face down your fears. You need that in your arsenal. Amen? So that was the first point, the spirit of power. Secondly, beloved, I want you to see the spirit of passion. Look what he says. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power. And then he says, and of love, agape. He says, excuse me, of love that is strong and passionate, benevolent, supernatural love and affection that love both saint and sinner alike. In other words, God gives us his kind of supernatural love. Agape love is a love that loves the unlovable. It's easy to love someone when they're pretty or they're handsome. But it's hard when we look at some people, they're not so appealing to us. Amen. But see, agape love says, "Uh uh-uh, I love that person because they're made in the image and likeness of God. And God said that Joel's ugly because I made him that way. (laughs) That's all right. You ought to look in the mirror yourself. You know, when I look in the mirror in the morning, I go to wash up, I go, oh, it's you, Joel, okay. I remember standing in the mirror one day and saying, what happened to that young buck? Got <laughs> no teeth anymore. <laughs> I take my hair off and put it in the oven and keep my wig warm, you know. <laughs> you see, beloved, uh, this supernatural kind of love that comes from God, it treats men fairly, and it treats them squarely, and it's willing to give without getting, and it strengthens us mightily in the inner man, and also the outer man. And so therefore, we never have to ever fear and worry about recrimination from anyone or revenge or retaliation from anyone, beloved, or retribution or accusation from anyone. The, the Apostle John said this in 1 John chapter 4, verse 13. He says this, listen. He says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Now listen what he says, for fear hath torment. Is that true? There is no fear in love. He says in in perfect love, it casts out fear because fear has torment. Oh, hear me, beloved. Hear me now. I'm saying to you that fear is a cruel, hard taskmaster. Amen? And beloved, it doesn't care one whit about you. Fear will torment your mind. It will torment your soul and your spirit. It will torment your emotions, beloved, your imagination, your insides, your feelings. It will control your life if you let it. And the more you let it and you don't stop it and you don't start calling on the promises of God, it's like a snowball rolling downhill and it incrementally gets bigger because of the gravity that's pulling it down. So what started off was the size of a golf ball is now the size of this room. And that's what happens with fear in our life. We entertain it. Amen. So that's why God gives us the supernatural spirit of passion, beloved, or love to fill us with his peace. He says, it's a peace that I can give you that passeth all understanding. And he says, it will give you joy unspeakable and full of glory. Well, how come you have so much peace? I can't explain it to you. You have to experience this. <laughs> well, how come you have so much joy in your life? Well, I, I, I can't explain that either, but you, you're just going to have to experience this. Well, how do I do that? Make Christ your Savior. How do I do that? Make Christ your Savior. Would you say amen out there? You say, beloved, then you'll be able to face down your fears. All the people and pain and problems and dangers and the disease, and especially your own besetting sins, because we run from them, don't we? You see, God's supernatural love gives us courage, and it gives us strength. And beloved, the Bible tells us it gives us boldness and power to utterly defeat these enemies. So, he's given us the spirit of power, the spirit of passion, thirdly, the soundness of perception. He says, and of a sound mind. The Holy Spirit infuses a sound mind. So phronismos into the believer. What kind of a mind is that that the Holy Spirit places inside of us? 
In Philippians 2, 5, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Amen? Now listen to me, beloved, because it's important that you understand this. A sound mind is a level-headed mind. A sound mind, beloved, is a rational, reasonable mind. It's a discerning mind. It helps us to be able to morally and spiritually and emotionally become strong and to think straight. Not carried away with our fears. Not carried away with our emotions. Not carried away with our imaginations. A sound mind. God hath not given you the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Would you say amen out there? You see, having a right inner attitude and fortitude helps you master and control your thoughts and helps you master control your feelings and your emotions, beloved, amidst all of these trials that you may face. You know, the Bible says this in Proverbs 18, 14, the spirit of man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit who can bear. You hear that, beloved? The spirit of a man, if you have the right spirit in you, will sustain your infirmity. All right, this happened to me. I got this. I've got to deal with it. But a wounded spirit, if you let people wound you all the time. Listen, beloved, the one who's suffering is not them. The one who's suffering is you. You need to forgive them, get them out of your mind. And the Bible says if they come to you seven times in true repentance, forgive them. For your sake. Not just theirs. Or Satan will hound you and drive you crazy with that unforgiveness and that bitterness of soul that you'll have. Well, beloved, let me give you my last point, and it's quick. I've shown you, one, what God hasn't given us. Number two, I show you what God has given us. And thirdly, beloved, what God himself gives us. I want you to go to uh, 2 Timothy, chapter 2, I, I mean chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. Paul says that my first answer or my first defense before Nero, the emperor, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. A bunch of chicken-livered, yellow-bellied, blankety, 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 blanks. I pray God that it not be laid to their charge. In other words, it would be laid to their charge if Paul doesn't pray, amen? Timothy, I mean, uh, Stephen prayed, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not, what, know not what they do. And that's probably what Paul is saying here. Verse 17, Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Now what he means by that is this. Nero, the emperor, was called the lion. And he was known for taking Christians and putting them in the arena with all of the lions. So at his first answer, his first defense before uh, Caesar Nero, what happened was God delivered him so he didn't have to go into the lion's den and be eaten alive like a lot of Christians were being eaten at that time. Verse 18, And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now ladies and gentlemen, I want you to notice the divine presence the divine constancy and support God himself gives us here. Note these four truths, beloved. You can face down your fears, number one, because God stands with you. Look what he says in verse 16 to 17 a. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. 17a, notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me. In other words, we are never alone in the spiritual battle. Amen. God is always right there with you. He was there with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abadamigo in the uh, fiery pit. He was there with Daniel in the lion's den. And he's there with you in the furnace of affliction that you may be going through. Amen. Number two, beloved, not only does God stand with us, but notice God strengthens us in verse 17b. He says, and strengthen me. In other words, and the Lord strengthened me. Now, beloved, this is supernatural strength that he's talking about. This is omnipotent, almighty strength by God. Because we get tired and we get wearied. And we get worn out in the spiritual battle sometimes. And God has to infuse supernaturally this strength. 
Oh, beloved, I can't tell you. I can tell you from personal experience from my lips to God's ears. There's days in the last half year I didn't think I could even stand behind this pulpit. And I said, oh, God, oh, God, my, my spirit is stronger than my flesh. Strengthen me mightily by thy grace and spirit in the inner man. I've been able to preach, thank the Lord. And so, beloved, God stands with you and God strengthens you. But I want you to see thirdly, God saves you. Look what he says in verse 18a. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work. He supernaturally delivers us from every problem. He delivered Paul. No one ever expected Paul to be released from prison, but he was. And he went back out on his third missionary journey and saved more Christians and built more churches. And thank the Lord he went into Macedonia and Europe received the gospel. Would you say amen? So God stands with you, beloved. God strengthened you. God saves you, beloved. Look what he says. Uh, he, he said in verse 18a, but fourthly, beloved, God secures you. Look what he says in verse 18b. He says, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. The word preserve, saos there, means he'll personally preserve and deliver you into his heavenly kingdom. Beloved, God preserves all those who persevere in the faith. 1 Peter 1.5, we are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Amen? God will preserve you, deliver you from Satan and demons. Now, beloved, let me tell you this, for being a pastor, God allows them many times to really torment you. Paul had, remember, a uh, thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan who was buffeting him. Because that's how Paul got so strong, how he got so anointed. You see, you don't make a muscle grow unless you tear the fibers down, amen? And you need to put it under work, under duress, under stress. And that's what God does with us as Christians many times. Puts us under duress, puts us under stress, so we can grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever, amen. And so, beloved, the... Uh, he, he delivers us from this in, inner turmoil. I'll never forget one time, I had been falsely accused of something, and uh, the authorities got involved in all kinds of things, beloved, and I'll never forget, my wife and I were praying one night, uh, holding hands, I was on my knees next to the bed, and I said, oh God in heaven, oh God in heaven, this thing is like a weight on me, a burden that I can't even imagine. Oh God, lift it from me. As only God can do. When I got off my knees, it was gone. Not only gone, but I forgot about it totally until someone finally called me and they said, you've been totally and completely clear. <laughs> I said, you waited a month to tell me that? <laughs> but you see, beloved, he'll so deliver you that you'll be able to face down your fears. Now let me close with this. Peter says this in 2 Peter 1, 10 and 11. This is what he says. He says, give all diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, he says, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be administered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Give all diligence to make your calling and election sure. You do that, you'll be able to face down your fears. Facing down your fears, let's go to the throne of grace.